There we go. Okay. All right, welcome to our return to in-person meetings. Been back here for a few months. Uh, this new format is integrated with members of the public via Zoom. Members of the public who are using Zoom may view and listen to the meeting as noted on the city's website and on the agenda. Uh, welcome board members and members of the public. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Logan Pitts, the chair of the Board of Community Services. I have the vice chair, Paul Castillo here, and board members Guido Boccaglione, uh, Carol Spence, Carolina, sorry, Carolina Spence, Carol Quant, and Omar Lopez. I swear I know your names. <laughs> um, thanks for being here. Okay. Uh, we also have our meeting host, Julie Guzzi, Amy Hennessy, and Shelly McClure. Uh, the host will coordinate comments from the public and assist during the meeting and take notes for any follow-up needs. And as a reminder to all present, please silence your cell phones and devices. If you're phoning in to join the meeting and you choose to speak during the public comments portion of the agenda for privacy concerns, we will rename you to caller and only show the last four digits of your phone number. And additionally, the city of Santa Rosa is committed to providing a safe and inclusive environment free from disruption and hate speech. And we will not tolerate hateful speech or actions. Everyone is expected to participate respectfully or if necessary, the meeting will end immediately. Host, will you please explain how public comments will be heard at today's meeting? Thank you, Chair Pitts. If you are attending in person, there are cards located at the entrance. Please complete the card and place it in the basket. You will be called up by name when your item number has been discussed and is open to public comment. You will be asked to approach the podium and state your name for the record. After an agenda item has been presented, the chair will ask the board members for their comments or questions, and then immediately following, the item will be open for public comments. If virtual hands are raised on Zoom prior to public comment, the host will lower all hands until the public comment item is open to all. Once the chair has called for public comment, those in person may raise their hand and wait to be called the podium, even if the comment card has been completed. Those on Zoom may then raise their virtual hand, or if you have called in, dial star nine to raise your hand and will be called in the order they appear on the screen. Those joining by phone will be called by the last four digits of their phone number. The host will then determine the order in which the public may comment, whether on Zoom or in person. All public comments will be heard until there are no more hands raised in person or virtually. Each public comment is limited to three minutes and a courtesy timer will appear on the screen. Any email comments that were received by the deadline will have been included and uploaded to the agenda prior to the start of today's meeting. Emails received are not read into the record. Thank you. With that, I call this May 24th, 2023 meeting of the Board of Community Services to order at 4.09 p.m. Host, may we have a roll call? Please respond when I call your name. Chair Pitts? Yes. Vice Chair Castillo? Present. Board Member Boccaglione? Present. Board Member Cruz? Board Member Lopez? Here. Board Member Spence? Here. And Board Member Quan? Here. Let the record reflect that all board members were present with the exception of Board Member Cruz. Thank you. Uh, on to agenda item three, I'd like to open the floor for public comments on non-agenda matters. This is the time when any person may address the Board of Community Services uh, on matters not listed on this agenda, but are within uh, the subject matter of our jurisdiction. Do we have any public comments right now? Post. There are no hands raised at this time. Anyone present? No. Okay. On to item four, the approval of minutes. Are there any edits or corrections to the minutes of April 26, 2023 from board members? All right, seeing no hands, we will consider those approved as submitted. On to item five, reports on upcoming events and accomplished events. Deputy Director Santos, hello. Hello. Let's give you a report. Thank you, Chair Pitts, I appreciate it. And I'll just direct your attention to the attachment you all have for upcoming and accomplished events. And I'll highlight that uh, for upcoming events on June 12th, Howarth Park will be open during the week for its summer operations, Sunday through Thursday, <clears throat> and then on Saturday uh, uh, and closed on Fridays. It's exciting, so we'll be starting up our regular summer session on June 12th. 
And then I also want to highlight the Kids to Parks Day that happened on May 20th. It was a huge success, uh, about 500 participants, um, really a really fun day, uh, lots of activities. And we wanted to give a big thank you to our vendors, Santa Rosa Water, Santa Rosa Creek Stewardship, REI, and the National Academy of, of Athletics. Uh, they provided activities in support of the event. So it was a really great day. That was the end of my report. Thank you, Jen. Will you provide the director updates at this time? Thank you. Yes, I will. And I'm wondering if we could pull up. I do have a little slide presentation for you. Not slide presentation, one slide here for you to look at, which is a little bit unusual, but I, I think it'll help uh, provide an update. There has been a couple questions over the last couple months about um, a development project off of Hearn Avenue. And if you can see on the map here, Hearn Avenue diagonally stretching across the screen, Old Stony Point Road on the left. And the blue highlighted box um, is the new, that is the development that has been in question over the last, recently. And so I wanted to show you where it was in relation to Hearn. So the developer is being required to put in sidewalk on the front of their, of Old Stony Point Road where their uh, development fronts the road. The other part of it, uh, only a tiny corner of it touches Hearn, so there is no requirement for them to put sidewalk along Hearn for this. However, um, the city is putting in a crossing across the property just south of this right here. You can see the red arrow being highlighted. So there will be a crosswalk there allowing folks to get south of Hearn and then anywhere else from there. So I wanted to let you know and remind you that um, while the Parks Department does review these development reviews. Our purview is for parks or park impacts. And so we really don't have, and therefore the board does not have any jurisdiction over sidewalks and, and verification of that. So if there's any questions about that, I as your liaison am here, I can help you offline with answer that question and get you connected to the right planning department person if you would like more information. Um, thank you. Take that down now. And then also there's been a question about the uh, street light at Southwest Community Park where the bus stops at Southwest Community Park. And I wanted to let you know that um, we have brought this to the attention of the appropriate departments, which are the Transportation uh, and Public Works Department, specifically Transportation, as well as our Transit Department in Transportation and Public Works Department. So those folks have been notified that there's um, a request for additional lighting there that's not necessarily within the park. The park closes at sunset, so there is no need to have uh, lighting inside the park necessarily, uh, but we'll keep an eye on that and see how that progresses. And again, it's one of those things, it's on the borderline of a park, so we try not to get too prescriptive about what's required, but we do, uh, we do have put the recommendation forward and we'll keep you updated as we, as we hear more. Um, also like to announce that Luther Burbank Home and Gardens is always looking for volunteers uh, to work in the gift shop and lead docent tours. It's a wonderful organization that runs that uh, park for us and the historical buildings. And if there's anybody interested, or if you know anybody, uh, certainly you can reach out to me, but uh, feel free to go directly to Luther Burbank Home and Gardens. Uh, we also wanted to note that the uh, Prince uh, Gateway Park Spray Ground is going to be opening this weekend on Saturday. And it'll be open starting this Saturday until the end of summer from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. every single day. Super excited about that. A little cool to open it, but you never know. We have to pick a date and um, it'll, be, it'll be highly used as it always is. Uh, last time I mentioned some folks that were recognized for service to the city of more than 10 years. And we had two groups of folks that have been receiving uh, recognition. And um, I mentioned a group last time, but I wanted to follow up with the group um, this time as well that were left out of that. We have, um, with 15 years of service, Jason Parrish, our administrative services offer, officer for Rec and Parks, and Ryan Shepard with 20 years of service as a rec coordinator. And uh, Rob Beal, our recreation supervisor with 35 years working for the city. So I wanted to put that out there. Um, I also wanted to update you all that um, you heard last time that our um, 
Aquatic Supervisor Dog Hits is retiring in July, and we are happy to announce that uh, one of our own, Brandon Hammond, has been promoted to replace John Hicks, and so there'll be some great overlap there of training going on. We're really excited for Brandon to take on that position and for the training to ensue and to have the download of John's knowledge <laughs> as much as possible. Um, and last but not least, I also wanted to mention that uh, yesterday at City Council, we had a Public Works Week proclamation uh, where our parks maintenance staff were there to receive um, accolades for uh, working as hard as they do and uh, out there servicing the city's infrastructure along with all of our other public works partners in public works, transportation of public works. And they tonight are having an event from five to eight <laughs> 30 at Courthouse Square uh, in recognition of Public Works, City Works. And so there'll be a lot of equipment and maintenance staff out there. Um, if you have time after this um, meeting tonight, it's a great place to go and check out. Okay, end of my report. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions from the board on the report? All right. Uh, we will now move on to reports from board members. So this is just our brief updates relevant to rec and parks uh, within our jurisdiction. We'll start with board member Lopez. Do you have a report from this month? I do actually. I was able to attend an event at Bennett Valley Golf Course. This was actually my first time in that specific venue. Um, so I want to say it was a really beautiful venue. The view of the golf course from that venue was amazing. Um, and so I was just very happy to attend. Thank you. Board member Spence, do you have a report from this month? Um, I was at the same event, <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was great, and and it is a beautiful view, and I think the more people see it, it's going to really catch on. I think it has a whole lot of potential to it. And then I went also because I was doing the call on Sunday at the arena to a Nagasaki Park, and. That's a lovely little setting. It's just peaceful and quiet. It really is. I would encourage anybody who has a little a frantic day to take a little drive by there. And just It's really wonderful. So I encourage you all, not that you are all not in total control of your life. <laughs> I wish. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the report. Board Member Kwan. So the thing I was most excited about was going to a youth park. Um, a very long time ago, both my daughters were camp counselors at Camp Yuchi, and I never got beyond the surface. So after I checked out the um, 16th scale train, which I felt uncomfortable riding without a small person with me, <laughs> I went for a walk. And I had no idea that there were 70 acres to that park. I kept going further and further. Um, the uh, Frisbee golf course, the bicycle track. What? What? I don't want to talk about that. Um, <laughs> it, it was just amazing and overgrown. And I made some inquiries. And I heard at one time there were um, development plans for this park. Uh, Jenna, I would love to hear some background on Youth Park because it is a diamond truly in the rough in um, the northwest quarter. I also uh, got myself down to City Council and placed myself set front and center to take pictures of two of our park maintenance staff, Elio and Tim, um, while they were being recognized with the rest of the members of Public Works. And I was able to help up, help for a while with the Clean Santa Rosa Mendocino Avenue cleanup a couple of Fridays ago. Nice. Thank you for staying active, Carol. Um, Board Member Bocaleoni, do you have a report from this month? Uh, other, nothing special other than uh, Southside's Community Park. It's uh, very good, very busy, and it's neat, it's clean, and uh, I was glad to hear the, some of the comments that our director made. <laughs> so I'm glad that some of that is going to be looked at. Thank you. Good. Thank you for advocating. Vice Chair Castilla, you have a report. Uh, I checked out Pioneer Park. It is a lovely little park. It's very close to my home. My kids enjoyed it. It was great. 
Uh, second comment is something get on record. Uh, I was actually downtown sitting on the benches and thinking about the bench issue. And just for the record, my thoughts are we should either have comfortable benches or perhaps no benches and use that money towards public arts or public something. But having benches that are uncomfortable for everyone, there's really no point in having those benches. They're more uh, little statues at that point. So that's just. That's my update, that's what I got. Thank you for the update, Paul. Uh, my update for the month is, uh, my new park for this month was Fur Ridge Park in Fountain Grove, which is a small one. Um, I think it was rebuilt uh, pretty recently. Uh, everything looked brand new. Um, and also a quiet little refuge up there. Um, and I attended an event on Sunday in Courthouse Square. Uh, it was hosted by the Art and Public uh, Places Committee. It was to work on the general plan for the city, and they were trying to bring in more young residents uh, using artwork. Um, and I got there at the end, so near the end, so I'm not sure how the attendance was, but it looked like there had been a lot of folks there. There were a lot of posted notes on the board, and uh, great to see Courthouse Square being used like that. So that's my report for the month. All right. Moving on to our scheduled items, uh, we are going to switch these around a little bit and go for 8.2. We first will hear from Assistant Parks Planner Emily Ander, who uh, will present the BOCS ordinance recommended updates. Uh, this is uh, just as a reminder, the subcommittee that was formed of myself and Carol and our former member Terry Griffin to update our ordinance which hadn't been done in quite a while. So uh, thank you again, Carol, for that work. Um, and hopefully we can, we can kind of wrap that up today. <laughs> so take it away, Emily. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Pitts, Vice Chair Castillo, members of the board. Uh, I'm Emily Ander, Park Planner Assistant, and I'm here today to follow up with you on Three items in particular related to the board's bylaws and ordinance, which we last discussed in February. Next slide, please. The three items that I'd like to discuss and hopefully come to decisions on today are the meeting start time for your monthly meetings, uh, whether or not the board should add a youth member, and also what type of advisory body this group should be. I'll go through each item separately and then provide the opportunity for the board to discuss and decide on each item. Next slide, please. So one of the subcommittee's proposals to the full board in January was to change the start time of the meetings from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Um, we discussed this in January and in February, and the first time it was discussed, um, it seemed like the most of the members present were um, comfortable moving forward to a 5 p.m. start time. When we brought it back in February for a decision, um, and then uh, chair asked each individual member um, their opinion, that we had a pretty even divide between 4 p.m., 5 p.m., or whatever works best for the board and the public. Um, so the board asked that staff to go back and research that further, and then bring the findings back to the board. Um, next slide, please. So we kind of have four points of consideration for you to make, hopefully, help you make this decision. Um, so staff looked into where the board's meeting time appears, um, and therefore where it will need to be updated if you do choose to change the meeting time. And we found that it appears in the board's bylaws, but not in the ordinance or any council policies or in the city code or the city charter. And this is a very good thing because it means the decision is completely in your hands. Um, it doesn't need to go any further. Um, and then, so in addition to that, we met with the city clerk's office, and the clerk recommended that if the board desires to change the meeting time, that that change should occur as soon as possible. And that's because she felt that um, the appropriate time to change the meeting would be when a new council is seated and they make their appointments to the boards, and so you have um, a new group, or a partially new group of people, as we have now. Uh, and the third thing, uh, the clerk said that if you do choose to change the meeting time, um, she recommends that you do it for a minimum of two years. Um, 
that helps you kind of get into a rhythm, see if it's working for the public, if it's working for you, and then um, it's a little bit less of a burden on administratively uh, on the clerk's office and on the reporting secretary. Um, next slide, please. And then I also just wanted to remind you that the city charter does um, say in section 11B that whenever practical, uh, boards that deal with issues of interest to the public, um, such as the Board of Community Services, that um, your public hearing should um, occur no earlier than 5 p.m. And I believe that in general, uh, staff in communication with the board chair try to um, organize the agendas of each of the meetings so that items that are of interest to the general public occur at or after 5. Um, of course, it depends on the, how quickly the meetings flow, but um, it is certainly the intent to do that. Next slide, please. So if the board would like to change the meeting time, how do you go about doing that? Um, we begin by a member motioning to change the meeting time to whatever time you choose, um, and then it being seconded, seconded by another member and the majority supporting it, um, mm -hmm. and then we would update the bylaws and we would adopt the bylaws with every time. Um, and then Shelly would work with the communications team to update the web page for the board. And um, she would update our meeting template, like our meeting minute templates and the agenda template, you know, with the new time. And she'd have to work with the city clerk's office to update uh, the guide for city advisory bodies, as well as Legistar. And Legistar is the city's calendar where all the meeting minutes for boards and um, commissions in the council are available to the public. Uh, next slide, please. So um, as you know, the, the meeting time is currently 4 p.m. The proposal is that it changed to 5. Um, but staff is certainly open to other meeting times as well. Um, with that information, I'd kind of like to turn it back over to you and see what questions you have. Um, what your interest is at this time. Okay, thank you, Emily. You wanted us to do these each individually. Is that better for you? That was my intent. If you'd like me to go ahead and you no, want to talk about it at the end, I'm happy to do that as well. We can do this now. That's fine. Um, so let's uh, have a discussion among the board. Um, we'll go. We'll have everyone speak just so we can hear hear from everyone. Let's start with with, uh, with Elmar. What are your thoughts on this? So I absolutely support the 5 p.m. time. I think 4 is very early for a lot of working people. I know I myself have to take time out of my job to come here. Um, so I think if we're doing something in the interest of public accessibility and involvement, it should be changed to 5 or later. Okay. Thank you. Do you have, so 5, do you have any other suggestions or just 5? I would say 5. We do run into conflict with Santa Rosa City Schools Board of Education on Wednesday, so that's sort of at 6. Okay. Um, so I would say five would be a good time, especially if we are looking to put um, public interest items towards the beginning of our agenda. Okay, I appreciate that background. Thank you. Carolina, what are your thoughts? Um, well, I love the four o'clock time, but I, I realize I'm not in the clock time business anymore. <laughs> um, was there, what, and what, what are other options? Any option we want at all. It's I mean, up to us. What if we split it and said 430? That's an option. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, can I have a big tantrum? <laughs> you, you can have a tantrum if it's important. Yeah. You know? <laughs> a respectful one. Um, okay. Thank you for your thoughts. Sure. Carol, what are your thoughts on this? So um, I don't know if this board, which has been in existence since the 1980s, has always had a four o'clock start time. If there has been public um, concern before. Uh, my main concern is that the public's input, which does not happen at every meeting, but when there is public input, it's usually about a very passionate um, situation such as pickleball, and that the public have options. There is the email option, there is the recorded option, there is the um, phone-in option, and there is the in-person option. So. What's most important to me is that the public have that opportunity regardless of the start time. 
with a four o'clock start time with our meetings usually lasting two hours. We're usually done as a group around six o'clock. If we go to five o'clock, we would be finishing more like seven. And as I recall, the uh, staff additional expense would be approximately $5,000 a year amortized over how many meetings we have. Thank you, Emily. So it's not a tremendous amount of money being spent. Um, again, like Carolina, I am retired. I don't like driving home in the dark. That only happens during the winter. I need to be respectful of people who do work for a living and, and respect people who go to school and work for a living. And if a later start time is better for them and the public is neither hampered, uh, I, I see that kind of as a push that the public has opportunities either way. Um, I also appreciate the splitting of 430, but for people who work for a living, that may be uh, a token effort at best. So maybe not not enough, but um, I will go with the will of the majority. Okay. Thank you, Carol. Guido, do you have any thoughts on changing the meeting start time? Well, Carol made a good point. That was uh, four, you're done at six. You go five, you don't get done till seven. And if you got to get home and cook, you really ever miss your dinner. <laughs> so it really doesn't make any difference because I'm retired, but I'm just thinking of people with the children and kids that might want to watch some of these uh, meetings uh, that kind of interrupt stuff right in the middle of the dinner time. So that's the only thing that I can think of. Okay. Paul, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, first question, did we get any sort of public comment or input on this? Is this, did, did anyone submit anything? No, we didn't get any sort of public comment. Um, all right, that'd be my biggest issue, just wanting to hear, obviously, what works with public. On a personal level, I mean, the later, the better for me. So if we did 6 o'clock, would be awesome. Uh, but as far as uh, the four historic start time, um, obviously, I'm, I'm here. Uh, with respect to 5 o'clock, I think that's fine. My only concern, to Guido's point, if you have small little ones or something you're trying to get around, that's a it's like just a tough stretch. Not that four to six is that much better, but I feel like, you know, if you can get your public comments within the first uh, 20 minutes, you can get out of here by like 4.30. That's probably helpful to people. But in that same token, I don't think 5.30 would, you know, crush people either. Uh, but it's important when people are gonna show up regardless and they have the option. Uh, so with that being said, I'm, I'm fine with five. I, I think that works. Uh, the, the nice compromise of 4.30, I didn't even think about that. That's a good one. Um, but for individuals that work, taking time off, I understand that's, that's burdensome as well. Uh, so I'm either in the 4.30 or 5 camp, whatever whatever kind of works for the team. Okay, thanks for your thoughts, Paul. I So originally, 5 was my suggestion at the at the, sub, the ordinance subcommittee. I thought about it more, and I, I think 6 would actually be better. But I'm hearing uh, folks saying that might be a little late. And so I think five is a good midpoint right now. Um, I think also, while I appreciate the suggestion to do it for two years, we can do whatever we want. These are our bylaws. So if we really hate it, we can change it um, after a year or after six months. And there's good reasons to, to do it for, for longer, um, but that's up to us. So if we really hate it, we can, someone can introduce another motion to change it. Um, and garner our majority and then it'll be changed right then and there immediately um, we won't have to go through a long process so and i did i did some research on some other cities um for example petaluma starts some meetings at 6 p.m to encourage more public access um and like i said that's that's kind of where i've moved towards but i understand if that might be too late for some folks um so i think five is a good good landing spot um, and we, we did discuss that at our subcommittee, so we didn't just bring it out of nowhere. Um, if we want to change the time, we need a motion in a second. So does anyone want to do that? I'll make a motion that we start at 5 o'clock. Thank you, Guido. I'll second. 
Okay. Any further discussion needed from board members? If you have any other thoughts, that's that's totally fine. I will say, um, if we look at all of the boards and commissions, I think most of them do happen during the work day. It is the exception that happens at night, not the rule in Santa Rosa. I did not look at any thing outside of the city of Santa Rosa. That's true. The only board that starts after five is the community advisory board. Uh, which is at six, I think, yeah, and the idea being that they are the community advisory board and people should have access. Um, that's that's a good point, Carol. Okay, any other discussion on that motion? We'll revisit this in three months and see what we think that. Whoa, I don't know about, yeah, that's a good idea, actually. Um, <laughs> we'll do that, why don't you save that for item 11, and we'll put that on a future agenda to review it. Um, I know. I know. One other point to the working people, mm -hmm. 4.30, it's worthless to you guys. 4, 4.30 is the same thing. If, if it doesn't push all the way to, to 5, it's as if it didn't push at all. Is that correct, Logan? That's how I feel. I don't know. Other folks? Oh, for me, it makes no difference. Again, uh, work-wise, best, best is 6. <laughs> so, but uh, 4.30, 4, 4.35, all the same. I guess the way I would look at it is if people get out at five, let's say 30 minutes to commute here. During those 30 minutes, we do our sort of beginning process that does not necessarily require the public to be here just yet before we start going through our eye. So that would be my thought. If we do 430, that shifts at the five. So right as people are getting out of work, they need to rush over here to make it public happen if they want to. I agree. Um, OK. Any further discussion? Do you want to amend your ordinance to come back in a few months? We could do that. Or we can just have it on a future agenda. I think future agenda is fine. As long as it's calendared, we know. I'd like to see if we get any more public participation on it. That's, that's my biggest thing. If people start showing up at five, I think that's cool. Um, and then we know that kind of works. Uh, but I, I think, you know, let's try it for a few meetings, see how it goes. And maybe we do end up compromising for three. Okay. One question for staff. How is this advertised? Is it just like an update on the website or is there any sort of announcement of a new meeting time? I don't think so. Okay. You just, yeah. When you update the agenda and go post it at City Hall, uh, we would make a time. note that right. there's a new time. I, yeah, that, that please note the new time. Is it possible the city could at least do like a social media post or something, just announcing the new time? I can certainly answer. Thank you. Okay. Um, great. Any further discussion needed? Okay. Then we'll we'll uh, call the vote. All those in favor of changing the meeting time to five p.m. Please say aye. 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 Uh, any opposition or abstentions? Great. Passed unanimously. Okay. Thanks, Emily. Um, next, we'll move on to the. Oh, I'm sorry. One follow up question. Yes. Is that going to start? So that's, we amended as of this date. So it's going to start immediately. Next meeting going forward. And then next forward. next right. meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Unless yeah. you would like to defer it to a future meeting. I think. Well, I think time. If we're doing it via amendment, I think it's immediate action. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like. Yep. Deferred. We'd have to do another vote if yeah. we want to defer it. So next month is when we'll start. Just okay. Great. Thank you. See you guys at five. Yep. <laughs> um, all right. On to the youth member. Next slide, please. So at the January meeting, the subcommittee proposed adding a youth member to the board. Uh, the full board was interested and supportive of that idea. And so we asked staff to go and do some research and then return to the board with um, what we learned. So we talked with the city clerk's office, as well as the city attorney's office and other reporting secretaries about if and how this could work. And although there was no language regarding these members in any of the city's governing documents, um, we did learn about two recent examples of youth members on advisory bodies. The first example, which Logan brought to our attention, is the city charter review committee, which he served on. There was one youth member on that committee, and that individual was appointed directly by the mayor. The second example is on the Citizen Advisory Committee for the general plan update. There is one youth member on that committee, and they are non-voting and an at-large member. 
um, and they were recruited at the beginning of the general plan update process. Um, the planning and economic development staff um, created a presentation that they took to many of the Santa Rosa high schools uh, to introduce the students to what a general plan is and try to encourage them to get involved in Santa Rosa's general plan. And at that time they said, hey, if you're really excited about this, um, fill out a city application and join the citizen advisory committee. So um, I'm not exactly sure about this, but I'm, I would assume that staff and the, um, probably just staff, but maybe that staff and the consultant team chose um, candidates from those who filled out the applications and it included one um, member who was a youth. And then that went forward to the city council and they approved the membership of that entire committee. Um, next slide, please. So based on that information and then on the conversations we had with the city clerk's office and the city attorney's office, um, it was recommended that if the board wants to add a youth member, that these criteria of, um, or at least a starting place for us to apply to a youth member. They would need to fill out the city standard online application. They would be a non-voting member and they would represent the entire city. Um, they'd have to be a resident of Santa Rosa and enrolled at a Santa Rosa high school. Um, they would have to have the consent from their parent or guardian. Um, the position would be a one-year term. Um, uh, we think that it'd be great to have the recreation staff involved with um, outreach to recruit um, youth, particularly through um, the neighborhood services program and the work experience program, where you know have um, excellent um, team leaders already. Um, but of course, we would do outreach in other ways as well. Um, and then that member um, would be chosen by the board chair from all the applications that were received. And so that information will be added to the bylaws. Next slide, please. Um, so the process for adding a youth member to the board would include um, someone making a motion, a board member making a motion to add a youth member to the board, and then having it seconded and uh, supported by the majority of the board. Um, then staff would take your recommendation forward to the city manager's office um, to see if they were supportive of that. If they're supportive, then um, staff would update the bylaws. We'd add a section for youth members under the membership article and also add um, a duty to the board chair, which would be like the last youth member. Um, but we would update the bylaws and we would bring them back to you um, so you could review and adopt them. Um, and then this information will be added across the various documents and platforms where it needs to appear. Um, next slide, please. So currently there is no youth member. Um, so the proposal is to add one non-voting at-large youth member to serve for um, one term. Great. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> um, yeah. Can, um, Shelly, can you leave up the slide that has like all the criteria, like two back. Slide nine. There you go. Thank you. Um, great. So we'll have a discussion now. Does anyone have any thoughts on adding a youth member? Guido. Uh, I had a comment. Uh, you didn't say anything about an age, but the song says it's youth. I think it should be a senior. So a senior and Good possibility that he's got his driver's license so he can come and go as long as he doesn't have to bring it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it should be a senior. Okay. A high school senior? Yes. And would they need to be under 18 so they're not an adult? So that's, that's whatever the legal so like ramification is. But at least he's senior. He's been in the parks. He's played and he's this and that. And come and tell us. This is great and that we should change that, you know. He's got some experience. Right. Okay. Omar, do you have some thoughts? No, I'll yes. take care. So fun fact, I was a student board member for Santa Rosa City Schools, so I do have some background as a youth member on that group. Um, and part of that was also clarifying this will be open to all Santa Rosa City Schools, not just Santa Rosa City Schools. But <laughs> yeah. With the well, I don't I don't know. Well, one thing I was wondering is it can it be public and private? Is it just public schools? 
And that would be something maybe, uh, let me start with this question. Yeah. Right now, if we were to make a motion, it would be simply to add or not add, and then we would go back to the actual sort of nitty gritty details of what that student board member would be. Yeah. So to that extent, I don't really support adding a youth member. Absolutely. Um, going into the nitty gritty, I would definitely, I'm not against doing a private school or anything like that. Obviously, there are still students, there are still youth in our community, so I would not recommend against it. Um, I just think we could definitely leverage our partnership with public schools, especially St. Arthur City Schools. Um, we are mentioning high school students in these recommendations, so without a specific age requirement, we are looking at a school age requirement. Um, senior, I not, how do I word this? I understand where it's coming from. Maybe um, junior and senior. Uh, I think I could be open to that. I think that'd be best just that way. Um, also, like juniors can definitely have driver's licenses and experience. So I would say junior and senior. Um, but besides that, that's, that's my thoughts. Yeah, Carol. Uh, points of clarification. This is a non-voting member, so this person's presence does not affect the quorum. Correct. Second <coughs> point of clarification, as a non-voting member, there would be no requirement to actually attend. I mean, I think that that is something we could discuss, right? There is no requirement to attend, but if you, if you miss three meetings, it's the same way as you, if you miss three meetings, then that, that would be something I would be interested in exploring yes. moving forward. Um, the other thing, and we have two new board members. You guys have been on the board for three months? Roughly a little bit longer. Um, four months? You feeling yeah, up to speed? I don't think so. Pardon me? I don't think so. Okay. Um, one year really isn't enough time to come up to speed if you were appointed by a member of city council who has a four-year term. One would assume that you would be on this board for four years and will learn more about um, a one-year term. You get your feet wet, you go to prom, you go to college, you're gone. And um, I, I, I think it's conceptually a very good idea. I have questions about its practicality. Okay, thank you, Carol. Paul. Yeah, it's just uh, in, in general, I love the idea. I think it's great. Um, with respect to making an individual voting, that would require an amendment to the charter, right? Is that correct? Okay. Yeah, and a charter yeah. amendment, whole different process, yeah. uh, far too involved. Uh, with respect to the one year term, since it is a youth individual, I understand that they're not going to be able to do much, but Honestly, it's more just to get a presence in the room, have someone youthful speaking. And if we're being honest, a lot of this is also to kind of pad the resume as well. So put something on there, um, just show that, you know, that you have community engagement. So as long as the individual is present and engaged, I think, you know, one year is sufficient for kind of what we're looking for, just having a presence. Maybe we do cut it down to two, you know, if they miss two meetings or something like that since it is such a small term. Uh, with respect to the age requirement, I think high school is fine. I, I think if you got some ambitious 14-year-old kid in there that wants to make his voice heard on the Parks and Rec board, go for it. You know, if he's a qualified applicant, um, so be it, as long as they're in high school and they're articulate and they can say what they gotta say, I'm all for it. Uh, so this is my kind of general thoughts, but as far as moving this forward, I'm completely in favor. I don't see any reason to be opposed to it. Okay. Thanks for the thoughts, everyone. Let me ask a few questions, Emily. So do you want us to do all this criteria today to like the eligibility and I would love some feedback on this. Mm -hmm. This is you know information that we got from the city attorney office, city attorney's office and city clerk's office. Okay. I, because my ideal would be able to draft some bylaw language and put it back in front of you for you to be able to reflect on and, and build off of. Okay. Um, I think that's what I was thinking. However, if you think it'd be better to bring the subcommittee back together and hash through language that way, that's another option. Um, I don't think we need to do that just for one one thing, because um, I think we'll be able to do it at a normal meeting. Uh, maybe not at this meeting though, and that's okay. Um, 
sounds like everyone wants to do a youth member. So why don't we, would it be helpful for you for us to just do that motion and then come back later and do the criteria? Yes. Okay. Do you want anything else? Would anything else in the order in that motion be helpful for drafting what you referenced? Okay. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was appointed <laughs> by the mayor, registered on this committee here. Mm -hmm. She got, got, got a hold of me and asked me, and I said I'd, I'd be more than happy to. And I'm sure the rest of us have all been appointed by one of the city council people or such. I think that a city council person should develop on getting a person from each to each district, district one this time, district two next time, so on. That way, that person, that student, gets involved with the, 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 the program of how things are, work, you know, mm -hmm. and gets to meet the, uh, the city council person and points them to this committee, you know what I mean? I think it should start there, just like I was appointed. So, to serve. yeah, that's an issue. So, you would want it maybe to say like a rotation yeah. of each council district? Right. Okay. That's interesting. That way, yeah. there you get involved as well. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No more. I do support that initiative. Uh, that was one of my questions is accessibility. We have a very diverse community in Santa Rosa, and some have more access than others, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, I know Santa Rosa City Schools, they would rotate the high school specifically. So, each high school would get one year and then it'd come back to it six years ago. Uh, we this point is really good about uh, rotating districts. Obviously, then the question would be is that the high school district, the high school or their neighborhood district? Which one do we choose? Uh, but at least something, make an effort to make sure that areas, all areas of Santa Rosa have an opportunity to send somebody. Okay. Yeah, I like that idea too. I, I don't want to do it per high school because you can transfer yes. high schools. So we could still end up with everyone coming from. Bennett Valley or Roseland or whatever it happens to be. And then that, that misses that point. Um, I like the rotation idea though. If I could just follow yeah. up on that mm -hmm. to the issue of the access. I mean, you know, that would require obviously having access, maybe someone in your school, something of that nature. Perhaps also an essay element. I don't know, maybe there's some kid out there who isn't necessarily super vocal and making his face present everywhere, but hears about this, writes a killer essay, has something to say. Is on the board. Uh, I just think having it as open as possible would be helpful. Um, that's my sense on it. Okay. But the appointment also is a good idea. Carolina. Um, I'd like for this first time to make it as simple as possible. If you can get a council person who has a young person that they would like very much to put on or had a talent for it. I think maybe it's the first time we're going to go with that. Uh, we're making a really big deal of this. And what we're just trying to do is get probably two years out of a young person who would sit and get the experience of being on this side of the table. And, uh, and not everybody drives, and not everybody cares to drive anymore. I wouldn't worry about how they're going to get themselves here. Yeah. You know, I, I wouldn't, I'd like to keep it as simple as possible right now and see how we all do with each other. And if we want to flesh it out later, great. But let's not make a mountain out of a molehill for starters. All right. Thanks for that comment. Great point. I like that comment. Yeah. Carol. Unfortunately, I'm going to throw some dirt on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn it into more of a mountain. Um, let's just say for the sake of discussion, it coincided with the beginning of the school year. Um, it's obviously not going to happen in the summer because the kids aren't going to be in school. So let's say for the sake of discussion, it started in September. It was part, you know, of the rollout of the school year. I would want students who were considering it to say to know from the get-go, this is a 12-month commitment, which includes summer. I would want anyone who's making that even consideration, just like us, don't apply for a board if you're not going to be able to make nine out of the 12 meetings. Um, and that that creates a bar. I would like these students to be held accountable for the get-go that they're engaging in a, um, a city governing body. If this is like a job and it's 
a life skill. It makes it more of a mountain, not honey. Um, it's more of a lump. It makes it more of a lump, but also it makes it more of a, uh, a goal setting that this is not something, it is more than just another line on your resume. Well, I, I agree, but I think they're also trying to pass the stats. The kids that are going to apply are going to be those that business. Absolutely. And unfortunately, I wish it was the kids who were in neighborhood services, and they're lucky if they go to JC because they got to get a job. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we'll get them too. I hope. But what if we did it for a school year instead, rather than a calendar year? Mm -hmm. I think it's more realistic to expect them to not show up in the summer. Um, <laughs> I think making a student sit here in a meeting during the summer is <laughs> is is a risk. Um, so maybe it could be a school year length, yeah. like mm -hmm. September to May or something like that. Um, seeing some nodding heads. That is exactly what Santa Rosa City School. Yes. Yeah. yes. All right. <laughs> Copying <laughs> people. Yes. And All about copy. It does work for them. Um, I know for student attendance during the school year for them, it's a hundred percent, if not. Oh, slightly lower um so but definitely summer they just crop it out from that mm -hmm. period yeah so that is always an option and okay. that, especially if we're looking at a high school student and we're emphasizing the student aspect of that what do you so let me ask you omar when you say that do you think it shouldn't be a student it should just be anyone who's a non-adult or that's actually a really good question i did not think about um the idea of someone who is still a youth and not a high school student in our community and that they want to be involved in it. Yeah. Tell, that, me, tell me what age you mean when you say that. Maybe sub 18, but maybe I I forget the word where they um okay, 14 plus at least you know. 14 to 18, not just not necessarily in high school, obviously some students may drop out. Um, there's alternative pathways, marriage, mm -hmm. uh, stuff. I can't think of all of that off the top of my head. So I guess my question is, could that be exclusionary language that's not necessarily needed if our goal is just a youth? I, I didn't want to have the high school. That's why I asked you know, sort of a leading question. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think we should have that as a criteria because maybe someone graduates a year early and they still want to be a, a youth commission member and we want, don't want to exclude them because they're not in high school anymore um, or whatever circumstance in life they're going through. Um, so that would be my my feeling on that. Let's okay. I have one more question. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Carol. Um, has staff given any thought to uh, how much staff time this additional component will take over the course of a school or calendar year? Will it take? We haven't done any analysis of that at all. But we can bring that back if you would like to make a motion to have a youth member, we can bring that back as part of the bylaws. Or you can wait to make a motion and we can bring back additional information. I, I think that is an important consideration. We do need to see at the city manager's office. Yeah. Florida above it too. Okay. Let's we have discussed this for a little while now. So I think that we're let's let's do let's try to do a motion to do the youth member and then uh, at a future meeting, figure out this criteria. And if it really can't happen the next meeting, we will reform our subcommittee and do some separate meetings. Uh, hopefully we can, we can do it next meeting, but if not, that's okay. Um, we always want to hear everyone's thoughts. So I think what we're looking for is a motion to just add a youth member right now. Nothing else on that I think would be best for moving forward. I'd like to make a motion to initiate the process to add a youth member. Great. I'll second. I'm second. Okay. We'll give that one to Carolina. Um, so motion by Omar, second by Carolina. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? Great. Okay. We're adding a youth member. Thank you, Emily. Fantastic. Um, next, we'll talk about type of advisory body. Um, in February, staff brought forward to the board if you'd be interested in changing the type of advisory board that you are from a board to a commission. And the board, again, asked staff to explore how changing the type of, an, of advisory board would impact your functionality and the type of decisions you'd make um, and bring that research back. So staff discussed the advisory body type with both the clerk's office and the city attorney's office, and both stated that 
Santa Rosa does not base an advisory body's decision making ability or functionality on the type of advisory body that it is. So the decisions an advisory body makes are based on what is needed of the body from the department that it's advising. So what does Parks and Rec need from the Board of Community Services? Or what the council needs from the advisory body. So for example, it was council's decision to abolish the Recreation and Parks Commission, as well as the Community Relations Commission in 1976 to form the Board of Community Services. Um, and this information also explains why the Board of Public Utilities and the Planning Commission have similar decision-making authority, even though they are different advisory body types. So really this decision comes down to what type of advisory body you want to be. Um, if you think that it makes a difference um, to you or in the community um, to be called a board versus a commission. Next slide. So the process for changing the type of the advisory body is similar to the others, um, a little bit more invested, but you would make a motion here today if you would like to change it, it can be seconded and supported by the group. Um, and then we would go to the staff and go to the city manager's office and ask for support to change the type of advisory body. If they supported that, then the staff would have to update the ordinance with the um, board to commission change. And that would be um, adopted by council. And then staff would also update the bylaws to reflect that. And um, then the update would be made um, across the various places that it needs to be made. But this would need to be made um, more extensively than either the youth member or the um, meeting time would need to be made. So we would recommend that you make that decision before the ordinance goes forward to the council um, later this summer, um, because the name would have to be changed in the ordinance as well as city code and city policies. Um, we're all in laser fiche where all of our public documents reside, um, as well as all the other locations we talked about with the other two items here. So keep that in mind. I mean, if you decided in two years to change to a commission, um, we would have to go back and update all of those documents. <laughs> so that wouldn't be ideal, but it certainly is doable. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so currently the name of the board is changing to align with the name of the department, um, as you decided in February. Um, so the department name will be decided by the city manager's office um, before the ordinance and support the council or before the ordinance and support the council. So staff would like to know from the board, are you interested in changing the type of advisory body from board to commission? And that would look like going from the Recreation and Parks Board to the Recreation and Parks Commission, or the Parks and Rec Board to the Parks and Rec Commission. Um, so, and I also want to say, and um, we are we will be meeting again with the city with the city attorney's office to actually talk about <clears throat> if you're interested in scaling up the types of decisions that you make, so that um, like the master plan wouldn't have to go forward to council. <laughs> we are going to talk about that, but that has nothing to do with your, the type of advisory body that you are. Okay. Thank you, Emily. Um, and uh, few, just two questions for me real quick. Didn't, wasn't there some sort of name change voted on at the budget workshop? Jen, did that happen? No, council did not vote on it. It was discussed. Okay. We, no, no action was taken. Okay. Discussed positively, right? There it was, was discussed as, you know, it could be either way. Okay. Does it seem likely to happen? That will become parks. It's not likely to happen at council. <coughs> not likely. Not likely any decision we made at council during the budget session. So we're still working with the city manager's office. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for that update. And then Emily, did we we didn't advance this through the subcommittee, did we? I didn't remember. No, we did not. Okay. No. Okay. We just because because um, they seem to go hand in hand. We wanted yep. to bring it forward. Okay. Because we also wanted to talk with council about it when we went forward with the ordinance, if they were supportive of that or not, 
that was before we understood that it's more nomenclature than yeah okay decision makers thank you any other questions from folks or discussion on this for changing our name Carol, or I'm sorry, Guido. Uh, call me dense. I would really like in black and white what the difference between board and commission is, other than the number of letters in the board. For Santa Rosa, there's not a difference. No difference. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. Guido. Uh, as I brought and showed you, that uh, I have a nice accommodation from the state of California. Parks and Recreation Commission. And I think when I was on Petaluma, I was on the board, Park and Recreation Commission down there for nearly 10 years. That's the wording they use. <clears throat> the state of California uses it. So if we should get a recognition, we get it, in our case, we get it worded differently <laughs> because we're different. But I think we should go with parks because they come before recreation. Park goes in first and the recreation gets put in. And be a commission and then we're in line with the state when you get a nice award that's my feeling is that if it's a state it's a commission we should be and Petaluma is i don't know about the other cities around here but um, i think we should do it okay any other thoughts from board members <laughs> before i got you carol so anyone else does this okay carol go ahead again so i have my ipad with me and i was able to call up city boards commissions and committees emily i bet you could cite this too um it's committee board services utilities committee board 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 authority committee board commission planning commission board board that's it um, I don't know if anyone else is considering changing their names. My personal thought is commission is much more official sounding. And as a member of the park and rec body, I feel that board is much friendlier. And I like to think of park and rec as a friendly place. <laughs> Just my opinion. Thank you. Um, I, I don't think it matters for a commissioner board. That's my personal opinion. Um, I would like us to become parks and recreation. So that seems to be the direction the city's going in. Um, so that's about the only change I care about. Uh, if, yeah, go ahead, Paul. Well, I, I just have a question regarding the next step slide. Uh, it may be a meeting with the city manager, city attorney's office, and then introduce the ordinance, adopt the ordinance. That is for more decision making authority. That has nothing to do with Correct. Or the name change also needs to be approved via city code. It okay. does because it's going to be updated in the city code and it'll then it'll be updated in the city code policies as well. It's kind of a trickle down effect. And we want to do it all at once yeah. because it's difficult to get onto the council agenda. So we're trying to just get this all into one item for them to vote on. Understood. Um, I didn't realize it had to go through much via the name change. Is there any sort of negative? Fiscal impact, as far as that's concerned, you gotta nah. Everything's digital anyway, so it's a good change. And can you explain, Jen, your, or Emily, whoever? You're not gonna like go out and buy all new stuff. It's basically as it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's as you need to order it, right? Okay. Well, and we'll be working with the city manager's office um, to find out what the decision will be going forward. We'll certainly provide the feedback we received tonight. Uh, to the city manager's office and, and kind of go from there um, to see if we can get a decision making point on recreation parks or parks and recreation. So um, outside of that, if we want to add commission or board, that would be great to know tonight as well. Okay. Did they have any input on this issue or they could? Not yet. We're still waiting for the board's feedback. Sorry. The, the clerk and the city attorney's office have provided feedback, but not city managers yet. They didn't weigh in one way or the other. Yeah. Especially yeah. said it's irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> we got more important things to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Because like the Board of Public Utilities, I think that's like, that's the only one that's in the city charter. The only one that is specifically spoken about the city charter. So I would say that that's probably okay. the most important board, you know. Um, so I think we all want to change to Parks and Rec. Um, 
but do we want to do a commissioner board? So uh, if we want to have a motion from someone to change it to either one, we can do that and one will pass and one won't, or we'll just have one, whatever we want to do here. I'll make a motion that we uh, go with Parks and Recreation Commission because boards is kind of boring. <laughs> Everything's a board and the commission just has a little bit more uh, of a prestige kind of organization. You know what I'm, saying? I'm indifferent, so that sounds good to me. <laughs> you want to be a commissioner. <laughs> Um, and I, I did meet with the mayor, had a meeting with her, and she liked it too. Okay. She said it wasn't up to her. She had to, you know, talk to her fellow people. And, but yeah. uh, she, she thought it was fun. So is that a motion to change us to the Parks and Recreation Commission? Guida, were you making a motion? Uh, yes. Yes, okay. Do we have a second? And we will have a discussion before we go. Don't worry. Does anyone want to second that? You all want to stay board members. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can say I'm very impartial to this decision. So I'm just. Okay. Um, I need a second, I'll second. <laughs> are you seconding the motion? Board seconding. member Lopez. <laughs> okay. So the motion has been introduced and seconded. Do we need further discussion on changing our name to the Parks and Recreation Commission? Carol. Call me old school. It's always been a board. I think it's more informal to be a board, especially considering 90% of the other boards for the city of Santa Rosa are boards, not commissions. That's just me. Okay. Oh, that's a good question. I, I don't know if you guys can answer. Do you, John, do you guys have an opinion on this? Do you guys care? We do not have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> we are we are looking to uh, city manager's office and uh, as far as commissioner board again it has no legal meaning for the city of santa rosa so it's it's yeah. it sounds a bit stuffy okay right. but, uh we need four votes you can vote no on guido's motion that's that's uh up to you as a board member um, yeah. Um, okay. Do we have any further discussion on Guido's motion? All right. All. Okay. All those in favor of changing our name to the Parks and Recreation Commission, please say aye. All right. Let's raise our hands just to get this on the record. Okay. All those in opposition. Yeah, I guess I'll okay. Deadline. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, do we have another motion? Uh, can I motion to become the Parks and Rec Board? Okay, so we now have a motion to become the Parks and Recreation Board for the City of Santa Rosa. Second. Second. Do we have any discussion on that? Okay. All those in favor of changing our name to the Parks and Recreation Board, please raise your hand. Okay. All those in opposition, you're, okay, unanimous. Thanks for being a team player, Guido. Um, we can, we can make the same. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> All right. That's why we keep you around. Um, great. We will submit that to the city manager's office and they can also just shoot it down, but we'll, uh, we'll see. Um, great. Thanks, Emily. You're welcome. We're all done. Great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no questions on next steps? Excellent. Yeah, any other questions from folks? I think we covered all that. Okay. Um, and we're going to come back later with the youth member stuff. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for switching the agenda around. Well, thank you very much for switching the agenda so I can get to my son's school. <laughs> That's very important. I'm sorry. I did move too fast. Do we have any public comment on that item? Thank you, Shelly. We have no hands raised at this time. Okay. Um, anyone present? No. Okay. We will move on then. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. To item 8.1, our volunteer cemetery, rural cemetery volunteer program. The deputy director of recreation, Jeff Tibbetts, will introduce the rural cemetery preservation committee overview of the volunteer program at the cemetery. 
Good afternoon, Jeff Tibbetts, Deputy Director. Um, I guess I'm becoming the hat guy from previous presentations of <laughs> wearing different hats, so I want you to recognize me before I uh, prepared myself for the, the introduction. Wow. Um, <laughs> so it is an honor to be here this evening and introducing this group. I know we've done some presentations in the past where we have had um, you know, maybe parents from programs or participants from programs, and we've always heard such great feedback from the board members when we've done that. Um, we know you love to hear from us, but um, that special uh, aspect of hearing from participants or parents for those types of things. So fortunately for you this evening, we have a similar type of presentation where um, we have an amazing group, our, our Rural Cemetery Preservation Committee. Um, for. I'm going to try to be as brief as I can so I don't steal the spotlight um, of, of what they're going to tell you about the group, but a group that has been formed for a very long time has put in countless hours over the years of volunteering, raising money, so many different things. Um, I came into the volunteer program and, and got involved with the group. I was very honest from them up front. While my mother was someone who loved to go to cemeteries, I never understood it. It's not my passion, but I quickly got involved with the group and realized what a special group it is, um, passionate, dedicated, um, and we are very blessed in Santa Rosa to have uh, such a group and it quickly as I was getting started working with the volunteer made me realize to see the best of the best of what volunteering can do um, for a community for a city um, and in this case for the rural cemetery so with that without stealing any more of their thunder it is my honor to uh, ask Bill Montgomery the volunteer staff liaison to present on um, I don't know how much of the story he's going to tell you because it's a, a three decade plus story, but uh, to tell you the story uh, that he was preparing for you today. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Thank you for your patience also, the yes. volunteers, and for appearing in costume, maybe not in character, that's okay. We, we, we usually appear in costume and in character, but tonight I'll just be Dr. John Boyce. All right. I arrived here in 1852, so early resident of the town of Franklin, which preceded Santa Rosa. And I served as a doctor in this town for 40 years, and now I'm up at the cemetery. <laughs> so I'm still here. But I'd also like to introduce two other characters I have with me. This is Kate Conover, Rebecca Sandkin. She's representing somebody from about 1900. Okay? And Nancy Godfrey, representing somebody from about 1947. And we're all representing about 100 plus volunteers who have been involved in the city. Of rural cemetery for a long time. Let me sit down so I'm not in the way of the pictures. So well, we'll just start talking about what it used to be, and this will not take long, I'm going to rush through it, I believe. Uh, the Santa Rosa Rural Cemetery was first established in 1854, and the first picture we have of that cemetery is what you see up here in 1920, 70 years after it was established. We keep looking for older pictures, but have not been lucky to see that. This particular picture was taken several days after the notorious hanging in the Royal Cemetery, the three suspects, and they run from the tree that's there in front of you. And if you look up the hill, you'll see that the cemetery was basically a grassy hillside, very few trees, and uh, looking pretty good. In front of you, you see the Grand Army of the Republic Memorial, which was put in in 1915, just five years before this event. So following this picture, Things changed a lot. Uh, at this point, the cemetery was actually four separate cemeteries. It was the Stanley, the Oak, uh, the Fulkerson, and the Santa Rosa Rural Cemetery. Uh, those cemeteries were private cemetery companies that had at least some maintenance uh, responsibility in the cemetery. And as they, as time went by, particularly we believe the depression, what you see here, um, relatively good maintenance disappeared. So the cemetery, which was established in 1854, organized officially in 1861, uh, became uh, a almost a no man's land. It was almost abandoned for about four years, from sometime in the 30s till 1979. And during that time period, uh, birds planted seeds, people put in all kinds of interesting things in the cemetery. So it became quite different. But by 1979, it was a disaster. Anybody perhaps remember that time? Uh, and at that point, the city decided to take it over by eminent domain. The city was being blamed for its condition anyway. Private cemeteries were pretty much gone, so the city took it over by eminent domain. The city put the fence up around it in 79, set up the first walking tour, and didn't put a whole lot of uh, other effort into it. So by the time 
uh, 1990s arrived, it was quite a disaster. It was uh, thick with uh, exotic plants and trees. Probably half of the tombstones have been broken down. A lot of tombstones have been sold. It was a discredit to the community. So in 1994, let's go to the next slide, please. In 1994, we started at the Santa Rosa Rural Cemetery Preservation Committee. And this is the picture just recently of what has evolved over that time period. From 1920 to current 100 years, all those trees have sprouted. So the old oak trees up there that many people think are 700 years old are usually only about 100 years old. And the cemetery is looking quite green and beautiful. And the Grand Army of the Republic Memorial in the front, which was uh, decimated of its metal for World War II, has been replaced. The metal has been replaced. So it's in good shape. So we now have a committee uh, of about 100 and some bit of volunteers that are involved in a whole bunch of activities at the Royal Cemetery. So let's talk about some of those activities. Next slide, please. So we have a variety of things we do. Uh, one of them is maintenance. And you'll find the majority of our volunteer hours go into maintenance. About 2,000 volunteer hours were devoted to operations and programming in the cemetery uh, in 2022. And you can see someone's added more volunteer hours than the rest of Santa Rosa Rec and Parks combined. And a few shots of what we do there, you see down in the bottom left, uh, that's Kit Conover, who specializes in restoring cemetery tombstones, and she's about half done. <laughs> <laughs> Once I get done, I have to start over again. Okay. <laughs> she, she mostly does the chemical treatment to get rid of the molds and funguses that make the tombstones almost impossible to read. You see in the middle, we have people that work on tombstones, uh, restoring them, replacing them. Uh, you see uh, people that work on just the landscape uh, purposes throughout the cemetery. The majority of the cemetery, which is over 15 acres, is maintained by volunteers. We got a little help from the city, but mostly it's done by volunteer groups. So next slide, please. So in addition to the maintenance, we have a interpretive and programming group and these people are the ones that do the, the costumes, like to be in the costumes. And for the last 25 years, uh, they've been doing something we call the Lamplight Tour, which is a tour in uh, September of each year, uh, where we go to about eight grave sites where characters from the past in costume with lights and props uh, act out a scene from their lives. And it has been sold out. This is the 25th year now, we're celebrating the 25th year. It's been sold out for every single one of those 25 years. In addition to that, we have uh, regular tours. For the summer, we have free Saturday tours uh, with a variety of uh, different subjects. You have in front of you a brown tan brochure, which has a list of our activities during the summer. And uh, then we also have special tours for uh, Cub Scouts, schools, and things like that. So next slide, please. Within the cemetery, we also have two special gardens. Uh, actually, we have three special gardens, you have to say. Uh, one at McDonald Entrance and one at Franklin en Entrance are both uh, habitat gardens where we specialize in native plants and habitat plants, and those are thriving at this point. They've been there in one case for 20 years and the other case for about five years. We also then have a memorial rose garden, and both of these gardens, two of these gardens, have been used for memorial stones, where someone that does not have a as a loved one that does not have a grave site and install a stone in honor of that loved one. So right now those are being stored in stored the Rose Garden. Okay, next slide please. And in addition to all that work, we have people that do the research. And the research is extensive. We're researching 5,500 people and uh, lots of information. And the most recent product of that research team is this book which is the product of 12 years of work for several people. And in here, we have 5,500 names with a little bit about everybody in here, which is as accurate as we can. And uh, we keep adding to it even to this day. So we have people that do that work too. So a lot of people do a lot of stuff. And what's good about it is everybody's having a lot of fun when they do it. It's a very amenable group. Everybody enjoys being with each other. Okay, now we have surprises at the cemetery. You can understand it's been there for 170 years. So next slide, please. So this is the most recent supply prize we came up with. 
a worker in one of the plots came up with a, a metal plaque, which was the plaque that was on a coffin at one point in honor of Grace Coulter. And she would, the plaque was in a plot for the Coulter family. However, the records show no Grace Coulter in that plot. So that gave rise to extensive research as to what was happening. And we discovered this was the grave of a man named Sterling Coulter, who arrived in the Santa Rosa area in the 1850s, first lived in Franklin, the town that was here before Santa Rosa. Uh, then he moved into Santa Rosa and later was named called, Stur uh, called uh, Squire uh, Coulter uh, because he was a tall, impressive man who was on every city board and commission. And somehow during the time uh, that the family plot was there since the 1850s, his uh, daughter-in-law, Grace Coulter, died. However, she was not buried there. Uh, we're not quite sure what happened to her ashes or what happened to the particular coffin plate, but at some point they were installed, probably without anybody knowing it, right there in that plot and only recently discovered. So we constantly have surprises about who's there and what's going on. So now we have a new name to add to the book. Okay. Now I'd also like to tell you just briefly about some of the interesting characters. Uh, we represent these characters all the time. So next slide, please. And uh, characters are diverse and there's heroes and there's villains, uh, all kinds of folks to talk about. Uh, interesting person to talk about specifically is Dr. Annabelle McGoffey Stewart, who was born in the 1840s in Virginia. Uh, he became a nurse in the city in the Civil War. Uh, she was a nurse who went with her husband, who was a doctor. And by the 1870s, they were in Santa Rosa. She had completed her medical training and she was a doctor. And while she was in Santa Rosa, she got the title of Dr. Deer. She brought so many babies into the world. Dr. Deer was her title. And her family memorial is there. Her, her husband, who, by the way, was injured in the Civil War, died later, about 20 years later, of his injuries. And she became a very famous character. Also, her two sisters, one was Frances McGoffey Martin. Uh, she became a, a, a pharmacist. Another sister became a lawyer and ultimately superintendent of schools for Santa Rosa. So three here young lady, three young ladies, born in the 1840s in what is now West Virginia, at the time was Virginia, rose to those status here in Santa Rosa. Next slide, please. Another important person we have here is, as you can see, this is a very important Victorian grave. You can see the grave to the right. It's very impressive, probably cost quite a penny when it was installed in 1879. You may be surprised to learn that Mr. John Richards was born a slave in 1824, managed to buy his freedom, married a woman from New England. By 1850s, they're here in Santa Rosa, and he has a skill as a barber. So he first opens a barber shop, and later on he opens a series of, uh, of uh, uh, bathhouses. He had one bathhouse in Santa Rosa, one bathhouse in Ukiah, and one bathhouse in Calistoga. Uh, the bathhouse in Santa Rosa, you can see it. This is the Kogan House. The Kogan House stood about where City Hall is right now. And just behind it, that building to the left and behind, that was John Richards' bathhouse. Uh, so John Richards did well, a former slave who did truly well, but he didn't just leave it at that. He wasn't just interested in his money. As time went by, he realized that the few African-Americans who were in this in town uh, did not have the same rights as everyone else. For example, when the school district was set up, uh, black, Indian, and uh, Asian children were not allowed to go into local schools. So John Richards took upon himself to start the first black school in Santa Rosa. Also at the same time, there were other civil rights actions going on, including the Freedmen's Convention in, in Washington, D.C. in the 1870s, and John Richards was the representative of Santa Rosa to that convention uh, in 1870. He did lots of other things uh, in, in support of the black community, and support the community all the same way. Okay, next slide, please. And finally, um, father-daughter combination. Colonel James Boydston Armstrong, his daughter Lizzie or Elizabeth. When Colonel Armstrong arrived in Santa Rosa after serving in the Civil War, he went into the lumber business. He realized by the 1880s that the, all the redwood trees are being cut down. And he said, we need to save some of these. The reaction from the lumber industry and basically the community was, you gotta be kidding. They're all the way from Santa Cruz to Alberta, for goodness sakes. That's ridiculous. 
but he persisted and he actually set aside a portion of his land that he'd like to give to some of the park. He died in 1903, that didn't happen. His daughter, Lizzie there, took up the cause. And by 1912, she got the Armstrong Woods to be declared a county park, and by 1935, it became state park. So this is the type of stories and type of people we have there in the cemetery. And with that, are there any comments from the other costume characters here? I'd like to say a few things. Yeah. If you would, come up to the podium. Yeah, go ahead. Come, 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 come up to the podium, please. Doesn't need to be in character, unless you want to be. <laughs> Uh, my name is Nancy Godfrey, and um, I saw a paper at years ago, June 1994, about the cemetery looking terrible. I love cemeteries. This is where you find out about your town. It's in the cemetery. The stories that are told on the stones. Then you strike, well, why is that? Why did she die then? And all those children died, or whatever. So it's always very interesting to find out. And I saw that, and I knew Bill through um, Montgomery High School. I said, I want to do that. So uh, here, 19, whatever, you know, we're 2023. 20, we're still at the bottom of Rock Cemetery. Uh, it is my privilege to say that I have helped the cemetery become what it is today. It is a thriving place. If you haven't been there, you need to take a walk. You can go up there. Uh, and walk around and see those stones, see the flowers, see the native garden, see the rose garden, see the birds. Get on the top of there and you can just hear the birds singing away. It's a delightful place. I encourage you all to go and take a walk one night. Thank you. Everybody's dying to get this. <laughs> you, know you know what? That's what my husband said. He said when I asked him to come out and help, and he went out there one time, got poison oak, and said, that's it. And he said, you know what? I don't want to go there. Everybody's dying to get there, and I'll be there one day, you know? <laughs> so that's true. Nancy is one of the few remaining original oh. volunteers for the for full almost 30 years. Uh, kid has been a volunteer for? Yeah. Oh, about 10 years now. So I'm going <laughs> to say that. Uh, I'm Kit Conover, and I'm a relatively new member of the Santa Rosa Rural Cemetery Preservation Committee. My husband and I moved here from San Diego in 2013, and we are like religious converts to Santa Rosa. We love Santa Rosa. My husband did a lot of research because there were a lot of places we could move to, and we decided on Santa Rosa. And when we found the rural cemetery, it was like the jewel in what we already loved about Santa Rosa. So hats off to Bill and Nancy. They've done years and years of work. And I'm just so appreciative to be a member of the committee. So, thank you. So do we have any questions? Bill, has anybody ever looked at the uh, Calvary Cemetery in Pendleton? Yeah, we've been there. All my family is buried. Okay. And there's people, uh, lots in there that date back a I mean, just forever. I think that's 1864, I think. When, uh, 1864, I think. Maybe. Sure. Yeah, I, was, I was gonna look into it because I, I go down there because I had put my wife in there a couple of years ago, unfortunately, and after 60 years. And uh, when I walk around and I go back and talk to yeah. her, you know, and I just uh, God, I'm the same old and decrepit. Just amazing. Well, our earliest tombstone is 1854. And uh, many of the cemeteries in this area have followed our lead by having lamplight tours. Uh, they happen quite a, quite a bit around here. Any other questions or comments? Uh, this is a good question regarding the native plant habitat garden. Uh, is that considered part of the, the park? Uh, do park funds go toward the maintenance of that, or is it all volunteers? It's volunteers. It's all volunteers. Installed and maintained by volunteers. Awesome, incredible work. And it's also recognized by the California Native Plant Society. They're having a training session there, uh, one in Southern California, one in Northern California. They selected that garden for their training session. Nice, very cool, congrats. Great, well, thank you, Bill, Nancy, and Kit, all for coming in and for being patient, sitting through our thrilling ordinance update. <laughs> um, Thank you for what you do. I'm a big history fan, local history fan. I've been there many times and looked through the graves. It's really cool who's there. Um, and uh, I do have one question. This may be 
maybe it's too serious, but what is going to happen when the county redevelops the old Sinead site? It doesn't that border your cemetery or is there? No, no, the county has two old cemeteries, two formerly popular yeah. fields. Yeah. One is in Sinead and that's part of the whole issue about what happens up there. My understanding <laughs> is that they've set the criteria that that cemetery is to be preserved. Okay. But in 1947, seeing that that cemetery was getting full, they bought a portion of the Santa Rosa Rural Cemetery. So that's the fifth cemetery down there. So they have about two and a half acres, and about 350 burials there, and they are beginning to get more active in maintaining it. Okay, but that won't be redeveloped as part of that? Okay, <laughs> okay. In terms of your name, my understanding is it's to be set aside. Yeah, okay. I've been, I've been wondering that, so thank you. Um, well, great, thanks for coming in again and for doing what you do. And thank you to Carol for being a great volunteer too. She keeps us updated on what, what you're doing. So um, Monday at noon, if you want to drop by, we'll be doing tours of the graves of veterans who fought in the War of 1812 to the Green War. I have a question. Are any tickets left for Lamplight? Last I heard, we sell about 400 tickets. Last I heard, there's about 70 left. Lamplight is September 15th and 16th, and uh, we have eight tours each night. Uh, you can, the earlier you buy your ticket, the earlier tour you can get. Right now, the tours available are probably the late ones, which in my opinion are more interesting anyway. So if you're interested, tickets can be purchased at the front desk. All right. Any other questions or comments from the board? All right. Great. Thank you again, Bill. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks for doing what you do. Now you have to keep the hat on, Jeff. I take my hat on. I'm just adding there. So there you go. All right. Look out, the rabbit's coming. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, good stuff. Um, okay, we are now on to, uh, I'm sorry, do we have any public comments on item 8.1? We have no hands raised at this time. Okay, no one present. Um, thank you, I remember. <laughs> uh, all right, next is item number nine, committee reports. Uh, still no mayor's launch happening. Um, we are working on that, uh, so hopefully next month it'll happen. Uh, Board Member Quant, do you have a Waterways Committee update? The uh, Waterways Committee will be having its first in-person meeting tomorrow morning since before COVID. Very exciting, and two projects will be discussed. Both, uh, uh, the Cannery Project, which is informational, and uh, a project uh, being built out on the Colgan Creek Reach on, um, well, it was on the airfield uh, it, uh, on one of the runways. Both projects will be discussed tomorrow. Where do they meet at? Yeah, uh, upstairs room, City Hall, across from Chambers, I forget the number, uh, 9 a.m. Thursday morning. Okay. Great. Thank you. The old airfield off, off of Stony Point. We got a park there called Airfield Park that used to be on it. Um, thanks, Carl. Uh, okay, item nine or item ten. Uh, Jen, do we have any written or electronic communications? We do not have any written or electronic communications. Great. Thank you. Okay, uh, item 11, are there future agenda items you'd like to see? I think um, we have one from Carol for the, a youth park update at some point in the future. Did it, am I characterizing that right, It's Carol? not so much as an update as uh, a historic overview. I, it's, it's a huge parcel and I couldn't find very much about, about it. And I'm not asking for a heroic deep dive, but if there's some, um, Department folklore, like where did it come from and where it's going. Great. And I think with adding our youth member, that makes sense to know more about the youth park. Uh, mm -hmm. Another agenda item, I don't know if it's appropriate, but um, to revisit um, Fremont Park, we seem to be getting very close to the uh, apartment building across the street. Okay. Thank you. 
Any other future agenda items? Did you have one, Paul? Yeah, I wanted to review the start time. It just see if you get any sort of oh, yeah. comments, feedback, see how it's going, see if we get more public comment at 5 o'clock than we do before. So uh, like August or September? Yeah, I think that's how I look. <coughs> yeah, let's do September, August. Okay, great. Um, see how that's working. Uh, I felt like I had one thing. Um, I guess we need to still figure out the youth member criteria. So you already got that. Of course you do. It's great. Um, anything else? Okay. Well, then that will conclude our meeting. The next regularly scheduled meeting of the board will be held on Wednesday, June 28th at 4 p.m. And with that, I adjourn this meeting of the Board of Community Services at 5.41 p.m. Thank you, everyone.